So the gospel lesson for today comes from Luke 21, chapter 21, verses 5 through 19. Hear the word of the Lord. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be torn or thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all of this, they will lay hands on you and will persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors and on all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair on your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. The word of the Lord. Whew. Yeah. Well... So good to be with everyone today. Uh, you may have noticed um, that this week in the lectionary has two passages from Isaiah, which might seem a little strange, right? And the passage I just read from Luke talked about uh, the end times. And you might remember last week we were talking about that as well. And there actually is a reason for that. <laughs> um, we follow the lectionary. And in case you're new to the lectionary system or haven't thought about it in a while, um, it's this schedule of reading through the Bible as a church. It goes on these three-year cycles. So uh, every three years, we've read through most of the Bible through the um, scriptures that are read in worship. And it corresponds with the church year. And what's happening right now is we are getting very, very close to the end of the church calendar. Uh, the Christian church for many, many uh, well, centuries, millennia now, has had this calendar of starting the church year in Advent as we're waiting for the birth of Jesus. And that's going to start here December 1st. And so where we are now is at the very end of the church year. And next Sunday will be Christ the King Sunday, where we celebrate Hallelujah, Christ is King, Christ will rule over all, and um, that uh, at the end of time there will be this end to suffering. There will be this time where uh, God's love is the rule of law, and this new heaven and new earth will be among us. And so that's, kind of, that's what's happening here as we are looking at these passages that um, kind of help us think about what it means to be the church, what it means to follow Jesus as we're waiting for that day uh, at the end of history when God will make all things right. So that brings us back to why there are two Isaiah passages. Usually there is a um, psalm and an Old Testament uh, reading, but they kind of mix it up <laughs> sometimes um, when it kind of is appropriate to do so. And Isaiah is a really great fit for this time of year because it captures our imagination and our longing for a world where God's love, like I said, is the rule of, land, of the land, and we can finally live in peace with God and each other. And it's, if you've ever read Isaiah, it is both brutally honest about our shortcomings and also extraordinarily hopeful in what God will do to overcome our sin and restore us. We're, um, 
a lot of our great prophecies about Jesus coming come from Isaiah. Um, and uh, right before this, uh, um, the, the, the second passage we read is the whole passage about the root of Jesse, this descendant of David who will come and um, be our good king. And uh, in the first passage we read, in Isaiah 12, um, Craig read for us this, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. There's that brutal honesty that I had done something wrong. God had a right to be angry with me, but the great hope that God instead comforted me, that instead God has become my salvation and that I will trust and not be afraid. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage for those of us who are trudging this road that, you know, looking for God's hope while in the midst of um, the, the, the struggles that we face. And it's my hope that every time that we have our time of reconciliation um, in worship, where we confess and we receive God's forgiveness, um, that we would be as honest as this about the ways we might deserve God's anger, but also feel the amazing grace of God's comfort and salvation for us, assuring us that we can trust in God and not be afraid. I think it's, as hard as it is, I think it's such a good practice for us to go into that honesty and every single week together say, we need God's help, we need new life, we need um, God's forgiveness and, and help to do, to try again, you know, to go out and, um, receive uh, the new creation God is making even in us. And the second scripture from Isaiah for today also speaks about great hope, and it's a favorite, I'm guessing, of a lot of us. It's certainly a favorite of mine. It paints this beautiful picture of the future that God is creating. It says, see, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I love that so much. And it's really, if you think about Isaiah, Isaiah is wrapped around the exile experience where you have um, the people of Israel going off into exile. And before that, they, they've lost what it means to be the people of God. They are not acting with justice and... Um, not being a blessing the way that God called Abraham, that you will be a blessing, to, I'm blessing you to be a blessing to the world. And so this promise that God's people would be a delight and a joy, oh, it even rings to my mind of um, that we would bring good news, that the gospel would bring good news to the world, that even as Jesus calls us to go out and um, spread the gospel, we would be good news, we would be a joy. Oh. And then the passage continues with this vision, saying that the sound, and expanding it just to the whole world, saying that the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. Lives will not be cut short. People will not labor in vain. No children will be born without the chance of thriving. That the wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. It's a powerful image says, they will neither harm or destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. And I think this passage is hopeful, but it also carries with it a sense of mourning. Because you can kind of get this feeling that the person who is hoping so strongly for this new heaven and new earth has experienced many of these horrible things that are being talked about. That he's saying there will not happen in the new heaven and new earth. And we have as well. I certainly read it this week with pain in my heart after yet another school shooting down in Santa Clarita. And like we've mentioned, watching um, protests around the world, growing violent, watching, there's just, there's so much that um, we, we see all the time where God's creation is most certainly being harmed. And we long so much for God's holy mountain and I actually think that this is one of the greatest evidences we have that we are made for heaven, that we are made for perfect communion with God and with each other, is that we keep on 
being heartbroken over these things, as hard as it is to be heartbroken about it, I think it bears witness to the fact that we were made for a place where we can live in peace with God and with each other. And somehow after seeing things over and over again, after experiencing hate and pain and suffering and oppression over and over again, we keep longing for things to be different. We keep longing for the heaven that is our home. But as Christians living on this side of heaven, this is a big part of the tension. This tension is a big part of who we are. And theologians talk about it. It's we follow Jesus who taught us not just to pray for the kingdom to come after we leave this earth, but to pray that God's kingdom come and God's will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. But certainly our world bears witness that we are not quite there yet, right? So we live in this time where we are both waiting for the kingdom of heaven in, to be in the few, new heaven and new earth, but also working for Christ's kingdom at this point, at this time in history. And many theologians call this concept the now and not yet of following Jesus. God's kingdom is now. Remember Jesus when he came, said the kingdom of God is near. It's now and also not yet. There is more coming. God is creating, and we have these hopes, um, even of um, the end times, but being done already now as well. It's this now and not yet. And we get to testify to both what has already happened and what we believe will come through the power of God. And I've been thinking about what it means to testify this week a good amount. Uh, perhaps you, like many of us, have been following some uh, public testimonies over the last couple of days. Um, I was thinking about how those witnesses, and really any witnesses who testify in a court type of a situation, testify to what has happened um, in the past, or maybe the present, what is happening currently. They're really not supposed to testify to the future. I believe that's called speculation. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> uh, but the, it's interesting because, yeah, our normal idea of testifying in a court, something like that, is about either the present or the past. And in contrast, it strikes me that as people of faith, we are called to testify to hope, to the future that God is creating. And the Luke passage I read earlier also talked about testifying. It's also, I had this whole idea of testifying and um, bearing witness in my mind um, this week with these passages because Jesus is telling the disciples about all of the struggle and opposition they will face. Jesus is not surprised by any of the things, you know, that are going on. But even in the midst of that, he says that they will testify about them, about him. And I picture specifically the disciples had this image of them even in chains before rulers that would go, bring them in to give an accounting of what they were doing and in and, and this dangerous situation. Meanwhile, explaining, testifying that God has conquered all of our sin and death and that we are set free to live an abundant life while they are testifying even in chains. And like Isaiah, dreaming about and standing firm in what will be true when God creates a new heaven and new earth, the disciples will bear witness to truths that will seem to contradict what is happening. And I'm reminded of the definition of faith from Hebrews that says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And I want to make sure and point out that though the disciples do uh, endure so many hardships, again, it's the now and not yet. They do get to see. Uh, the book of Acts shows us how much they do get to see um, God bringing the kingdom of heaven here. They get to see minds and hearts and bodies and communities healed. And God do such amazing things through the Holy Spirit, um, even Bef even in their lifetime, even as they're bearing witness to um, hope that is coming even further. And I think that is our call as well. And so what does this look like on the ground today? 
How do we testify to hope, to a future that God is creating in this now but not yet kind of part of history that we're in, or even in our lives when we know something is true and we're working still, God is still working in us to make it true? How do we proclaim to the world that Isaiah's vision is coming? that God is good and trustworthy and active and bringing salvation, restoration, has already brought, is bringing, will bring um, this to our lives and to our world. And one of the times in my life that I hold very dearly as I think about this idea of testifying to hope, it's a time when God taught me about one, how this can look um, was when I worked in shelters. And some of you uh, know this about my uh, background. Uh, this is kind of a second career-ish <laughs> for me. Um, but my first uh, uh, career, I, jobs I went into was working in nonprofits. And I worked with, uh, in shelters with, first with youth, uh, homeless and runaway um, teenagers, and then with um, families who were escaping domestic violence. And so um, we, uh, it was a safe house where uh, women and kids, families could come and um, be safe, but also heal, and also start to think about how life would look like, um, how life could be different. And um, the, the organization I worked for was largely publicly funded. It had a lot of grants from the county in different places. And so we actually, when we um, started working there, um, my coworkers and I had to sign a paper that said we would not talk about religion at work. And initially, I remember thinking, well, but my hope comes from what I believe about Christ, that the resurrection and Christ coming and God being with us in the midst of our suffering and, 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 and you know, how, how can I bear witness to hope while not talking about my faith? And I prayed about it and prayed about it, and God just pressed upon my heart that there are other ways to testify. Um, to hope. And so I kind of set my mind to that and my heart to that of how do I show what I believe to be true about these families who are coming to the shelter? Certainly about the, the youth too, that if I believe that God loves them, that they were made on purpose, that God um, hasn't given up on them, that there is hope, that there are more days um, to be lived and more grace to find, more blessings to find if they would hold on. Um, how do I bear witness to, to that truth? Um, in, 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 and I, I found that there were lots of ways. There are ways to greet someone that shows them that they're important, that they're loved. There's ways to talk to somebody when they've committed some sin or made a mistake that say, I believe you can, you, this is not who all of who you are, you know, that you can be forgiven, that we can try again, that God can create in you a new heart, create in you a new life even that's able to hope for things that um, maybe you thought just hopeless before. And it, a lot of my coworkers and I were people of faith right, who we viewed this as a way of worship, as a way of um, serving people that we knew God loved. And um, there is a, gosh, a story that I will always hold close to my heart um, about this power of um, being able to treat people a, a way out of the truth that you believe and actually communicate that truth. Um, there was a resident we had who came in um, with, well, she came in, she was pregnant, and she had two children um, who did not come in with her because they had been detained. Um, they had been taken by uh, child services because of their exposure um, to the abuse. And she, so she came in by herself pregnant, and at the end of her stay with us, um, she was leaving with three children. Um, she had gotten her kids back and she had given birth and it was, uh, man, talk about hope 
and God bringing new things. Oh. Um, but she stood up uh, at her graduation and she was talking about her time at the shelter. And she said, I felt so close to God when I was here. And all of us just start crying, <laughs> right? All of us, because that was our deep hope that by treating her the way, by loving her how God had loved us, you know, by giving her the um, grace that we had been given, that she would feel the grace of God. And it was just, um, I hold that as such an a amazing reminder that as we testify to hope, even our actions, it's one of the reasons why I really think as a church, how we do what we do is as important as what we do or what we say, you know, because if those conflict, I think we're sending one message and um, yeah, I just believe if you treat someone like they're loved, it can help them start to believe it, you know? And I think the opposite is true. If you treat someone like they don't have worth, whew, that can start to bear really horrible fruit in that life. If you treat someone like you think their life isn't worth much, goodness, that can really, and then maybe some of you know what that feels like, right? And so to be able to testify to hope in that sense. We are certainly speaking it out. We are saying the truths that we know from God, that there is a new heaven and earth coming, and there is um, hope beyond what we can do. God has resurrected Jesus. There is power in following Christ and receiving um, forgiveness and new life. Um, but we also, as we say it, we live it. Because that, I think, ultimately is how we testify to hope that is not yet here. We live as citizens of the kingdom of God, even as it is now and not yet. We live with the belief that God's love could be the rule of law, that compassion and forgiveness and truth-telling and reconciliation could be our first line of defense instead of our last resort. And all of it bears witness testifies to others and to ourselves. I really think it helps us in our spiritual health as well because it shows us where we put our hope. And we absolutely might come up against opposition and get put in vulnerable positions like the disciples. But we just might also get to see heaven come on earth the way that they did as well. To get a glimpse of that holy mountain God is creating even now. May it be so in us and through us. Amen. Now as we claim that hope, <laughs> we claim the God who gives us strength for every new day, um, let us sing together our closing hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.